Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, shall we? Father in heaven, what a gift it is that you gave to us. You gave us your Son. What a blessing, Lord, that we have your Son, the glorious Christ, who condescended to come into this world and to give himself as an atoning sacrifice for those who would put their trust in him. And he came and preached a gospel that you gave to us that enabled us to believe and be reconciled to you. So, Father, we pray that you would be exalted tonight. We pray that as we look at your word, that you would be the speaker this evening, and that your word would do its work in our hearts, compelling us to love you and pursue you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We beg for your help towards that end. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, here we are. We are continuing our series in 66 books. This evening we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians, so if you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Corinthians. Uh, As you do, consider this, that ministry is a true privilege for all Christians. Um, It's a privilege to be involved in any activity of body life together. It's particularly a privilege for those who are involved in ministry leadership. There is no joy like watching the church function as God intended it to function under his good design. But ministry is also one of the more difficult endeavors that a person can undertake. There is almost no end to the number of hardships that you will face in ministry. From the outside, there will always be some kind of opposition. And in extreme cases, it it turns into persecution. And those are truly difficult. What is also extremely difficult is opposition from within. And that's what we're going to be dealing with tonight. There's rejection, there's betrayal, there's desertion, there's gossip, there's slander, there's intense scrutiny. These things and more are what make all the the ministry very, very difficult, especially when you consider that the, the ministry leader is added to that the task of preaching the word to his body. Paul encountered all of these things in his ministry to the church in Corinth, and tonight's message is going to show us how Paul remained exemplary in his ministry despite all of these trials from within the church. 2 Corinthians is one of the most personal letters in the New Testament, and Paul devotes much of the letter to addressing issues within that church that arose in there, and many of those issues, and most of them, were addressing Paul himself. And specifically, these were issues where people within the church were questioning his qualification to minister and his qualification as an apostle. So it would be very helpful if we go through a brief history and overview of Paul's time with the church in Corinth. We doing okay sound-wise? Okay, all right. It's important for us to remember a few things culturally about Corinth first. Um, One thing is that Corinth and the people in Corinth had a, a fascination with public discourse and debate. They esteemed the ability to speak well, to use big words, complicated arguments, and all of those things. And that's important because Paul found himself contending with people in the church and they belittled him because of his limitations with his speech. And secondly, it's important to remember that uh, idolatry and immorality were rampant in Corinth. Ben mentioned this last week, uh, the temple of Artemis housed on some occasions more than a thousand prostitutes. And this is significant because uh, similar to his first letter, 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul speaks at length in this issue as well. So let's take a look at some of our understanding of the timeline of Paul's involvement with the church in Corinth. His experience with them begins on his second missionary journey. The first missionary journey occurred primarily on Cyprus and in what is now present day Turkey, Asia Minor. And he was there and he, after ministering first on that missionary journey, he returned and stayed back in Antioch for a bit. But his involvement with the, the church in Corinth begins in his second missionary journey. In between his first and his second missionary journey, there was the council in Jerusalem, and then he sets off on his second missionary journey about 49 or so AD. And he starts in Asia Minor, and he moves throughout Asia Minor, visiting some of the churches there. And then he moves across into Macedonia, and he founded the church in Corinth, and Acts chapter 18 tells us that he stayed there 18 months, and he was teaching the word among them. And so he stays there, and he teaches, and After the end of his second missionary journey, he returned back to Antioch again. He begins his third missionary journey about 54 AD, and he was based in Ephesus, and he stays in Ephesus for about two and a half years. 
And it's during that time that he learns that there's extensive sin within the church in Corinth. And so he writes a letter to them, and that's referred to as the lost letter. Paul mentions that in chapter 5, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians. And he says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. So there's a, a strong pull for sexual immorality in the church, and Paul is writing to warn them against it and warn them away from it. And then after that, the church in Corinth wrote Paul a letter. It had a series of questions in it, and Paul answers those questions in what we have in his second letter that we refer to as 1 Corinthians. Much of that letter is devoted to answering questions that they sent to them, him in their letter to him. And Paul writes, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, now concerning the things about which you wrote. So it's clear that there was a, a letter written from Corinth to Paul with questions for him, and he responds in 1 Corinthians. And then Paul sends Timothy to visit the church in Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians 4, For this reason I have sent you Timothy, who will remind you of my ways. So there's a need for the church to be reminded of Paul's ways. And Paul writes 1 Corinthians. And after they receive that letter, um, an event happens which is primarily the basis for 2 Corinthians, and that is that false teachers begin to infiltrate the church in Corinth. And there's two predominant things that they do. The first thing that they do is they preach a false gospel. And the second thing they do is they attack Paul's ministry and his credibility to be involved in ministry. Because if you want people to follow you, you need to attack the credibility of the man who gave a message before you. These were men who were accomplished in rhetoric and they came with letters of recommendation from worldly sources. They came with all of these letters. I'm so great and here's the proof that I'm so great. They were very, very proud men to the point that they even charged for their services. Paul comes to learn of this and so he leaves his base in Ephesus on his third missionary journey and he goes and he visits the church in Corinth and he confronts them about their following of these false teachers. A lot of times this is referred to as the sorrowful visit because when Paul confronted them about their, their departure from the true gospel and their embracing of the ministry by and the message of these false teachers, uh, they abandoned Paul and they put their support behind the false teachers. So Paul went back to Ephesus, a grieved man, truly grieved. He was grieved over the way that he had presented the gospel and they had embraced the gospel and now they had departed from that gospel. So Paul wrote them a third letter. That is a letter that's referred to as the sorrowful letter and it's in chapter 7, verse 8 of 2 Corinthians. Paul writes, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I did not regret it. So Paul writes to them a letter addressing the fact that they were abandoning the gospel and positioning themselves behind these false teachers, and they were believing the message of these false teachers. A little later, Paul sends Titus to visit the church in Corinth again. So Titus goes and he visits, and Titus comes back with a report. And this is the good news of this whole letter. Titus reports that um, the members were obedient and how they received Titus with fear and trembling. And the reason why is because they received that sorrowful letter and they heeded the warnings in that letter. So Paul was overjoyed when he received that uh, notice that from Titus that the church had received the letter and had heeded it. And then following that, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. After that, he planned a third visit. He was planning to visit them, and he did indeed visit them. But even in that, he was concerned about them. He says in chapter 12, verse 20, I am afraid that when I come for a third time, I may find you to be not what I wish. So the summary is that Paul planted the church and sin was rampant in the church, so he wrote the lost letter. Then he wrote 1 Corinthians and then the false teachers arrived and he wrote the sorrowful letter and then they repented and he sent Titus to them and bore a good report of how they were repenting. And then Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. All that is to show that there were four letters and three visits to this church. Paul had an awful lot of dealings with this church. In addition to the 18 months he spent with them when he arrived there for the first time. So he loves them dearly. And in all of their treatment of him, they were very, very harsh on Paul when they got behind these false teachers. And so what we're going to see here is that Paul has a, a very reputable, very good ministry, even in the face of hardship. And so much of the letter is a defense of Paul himself. It's a defense of 
Paul as his qualifications for ministry and Paul and his authority as an apostle. So we're going to take a look at first Paul's defense of his apostolic ministry. So he's defending himself and his ministry as an apostle before these people because, again, the false teachers were attacking his credibility for that very thing. Their message was, he does not have a credible ministry, and they had a list of reasons as to why. But Paul points first and foremost to his holy character, and we see that in chapter 1, verse 12. Paul writes, Our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially towards you. So what characterized Paul's ministry with them was holiness and sincerity. So in all of Paul's dealings with them, whether it was when he was establishing the church, whether he was shepherding them, whether he was writing letters to them, whether he was praying for them, all of them were done with holiness of character and sincerity. And holiness points to Paul's behavior and how separate that was from the behavior of the world. And his sincerity says that there was nothing about Paul that distracted him from his godly character. So what he demonstrated to them was an accurate reflection of who he really was in the inner man. What you saw on the outside was a clear picture of what was going on on the inside. And this was in strong contrast to the fleshly wisdom of the false teachers that Paul will address throughout the letter. These men were boastful on the outside, but they they didn't have any true gospel on the inside. Paul writes in verse 14, we, that is Paul and his ministry companions, are your reason for boasting. And Paul isn't speaking of sinful arrogance here. Instead, he's saying the merit of our gospel is borne out by the fruit in our own life. You can tell that our gospel is the true gospel because of what it produces in our life. All of ministry points to one thing, and that is that a sound symbol of a good ministry is the holiness of life of those leading that ministry. So Paul's first defense of his apostolic ministry was his own holy character. Secondly, he had a genuine concern for the church in Corinth. And this church was a, a church that was attracted to the world. They were embroiled in sin. There were believers in the church, but they were, they were in a mixed condition, just like the rest of us. And they were attracted by the world, and, and their life showed it. But Paul's concern for them con- compels him to confront them with their sin. We see that in chapter 2, verse 4. He writes, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. Not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have for you. So it's really clear here that Paul has, he has affliction and he has anguish of heart over their sin. He's grieved over their sin because he knows their sin offends God. He is grieved over that issue. And notice how Paul's grief and anguish led him to write with many, many tears. This is emotional interaction with them in written form. He is truly appearing to them, and he's appealing to them from a sorrowful heart. And Paul is referring to his sorrowful letter, which he wrote to address their sin. Again, this is Paul's fourth letter to them. When he says, I wrote to you with affliction and anguish of heart, that was his sorrowful letter in which he was confronting them over their abandoning of the gospel and getting behind the false teachers. Their sin was to abandon the gospel message that he brought them and to embrace the message of the false teachers. Their false gospel and all that it came with, their attacks on Paul and his ministry and Paul and his apostleship. But Paul doesn't take this as a personal offense. This is the part that's so important for us to understand. He's writing so that they would be made sorrowful, not against any offense against him, but because of what it did to the church. And there was likely one man who was at the head of all of this, these false teachers. And Paul addresses that particular man and identifies him in verse 5. He says, If any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to you, to all of you. So the any and the he here is probably a reference to this man who's probably near or at the head of leadership of these false teachers. And again, his primary concern is is not the offense that the false teachers have laid up against him, even though there were many. His primary concern is more the harm that is done to the church because of those false teachers. So he writes to them over that. But his concern for them goes much farther than just identifying the man's sin. Paul's heart for them is that the church would restore these people to fellowship 
inside the church, any that were following these leaders, he wanted them to be restored. So Paul writes this again after having heard the report from Titus that they did repent. He writes in verse 7, On the contrary, you should rather graciously forgive and comfort him, lest such a one be swallowed up by excessive sorrow. So by the time Paul had written 2 Corinthians, the man had acknowledged, acknowledged his sin, and the task of the church was that they would not only forgive him, but comfort him. And we know this, to forgive is not to ignore an offense. That's not what it means to forgive. You don't just ignore it and, and let it go. It's rather to release a person from their obligation to settle an account with you. When a person sins against you, they lay up an offense against you and they have an account with you. And to forgive them is to release them from their obligation to settle that. But notice that the forgiveness doesn't stand by itself here. Paul knows that it's not just a matter of accounting. We don't just forgive the man and move on. No, the sign that a person is turning from their sin is that they have grief over their sin and it's the responsibility of the church to come alongside the one who is genuinely grieved over their sin and to comfort them. So there's a point of application here for us and that is, do we have that kind of care for one another in this church? Do we recognize the importance after forgiving one who has sinned against us of comforting them in such a way that they are ushered back into useful, fruitful fellowship in the church? Do we make them feel as if they're one of us when we grant forgiveness? We need to make sure we do that. A third way that, that Paul defends his apostolic ministry is by a supernatural approval. A supernatural approval. And one of the characteristics of these false teachers is that, again, they would bring these letters of commendation with them to say, you really need to listen to us, and here's the proof. And while they were doing that, they were infiltrating the church. They didn't really want to evaluate themselves on the biblical merit of their messages. Instead, what they wanted you to do was they wanted you to accept their message based on the testimony of sinful men. And on that basis, you should listen to them. And the key thing to see in all of this is that they saw their value in the validation that was provided by other men. But when we get to chapter 3, verse 1, we, we see where Paul looks for his validation. He says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need as some, he's making reference to the false teachers here, letters of commendation to you or from you? And Paul is not looking for an answer to that question. He's asking a rhetorical question and he is declaring, we don't bring forth recommendations from ourselves and we don't bring recommendations or commendations from other men either. And we see that in verse two, he says, you are our letter. He's referring to a letter of commendation there. You are our letter, having been written in our hearts, known and read by all men. The changed lives that Paul witnessed when he was ministering to them on his first visit in Corinth is what speaks most loudly of all. It says, God used the gospel message that Paul preached to them. He used it to bring about an undeniable, radical transformation of the lives of those people at the church in Corinth, and everybody could see it. He said, that is the commendation right there. It's not the words of men. It is in the fruit of the lives of these people. So Paul is putting the evidence itself in view. He's not putting in view the speaker of the message. He puts the evidence itself. In verse 5, he says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant. So back at the beginning of the verse, Paul says the focus isn't on us. The focus is not on us. And the reason why is because the message didn't come from us. Our sufficiency is from God only to the extent that God chose us to deliver the message to you. God chose us, we delivered that message to you. So the focus here is on God. So Paul defended his apostolic ministry because he found his sufficiency in God and not in the role that God gave him. So there's a point of application for us here as well. Is it tempting for us to think highly of ourselves because of some ministry situation the Lord has put us in? What we need to think highly of is the one who put us in the, that ministry position, whatever the ministry position is. So Paul defends his ministry by pointing to his supernatural approval but then he also points to his preaching of a true gospel. 
This is where we're going to spend quite a bit of time because this is what is the crux of Paul's ministry, is the gospel message. And he, he goes through most of that in chapters 4 and 5. He starts in chapter 3, verse 14, and he's explaining the blindness of the Jews, both the Old and the New Testament Jews. He says, But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. So the Old Testament Jews had hardened hearts, but the New Testament Jew had a similar problem. The same veil remains. <clears throat> and we know what a veil is. A veil is something that obscures what's behind it. But when there's a veil there and there's an inability to see what's behind the veil, there's an inability to, to see the message that Paul is preaching. Notice that Paul doesn't compromise the message itself. Verse 2. We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul would not give in to using a method of the world to address a spiritual problem. These people can't see and hear and understand the message. His response is not to compromise the message. His confidence was actually in the gospel itself, and we see that in verses 4 and 5. These are some of the sweetest verses in the whole letter, the verses that follow here. He says, In whose case the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's the bad news. That is utterly bad news. That's the worst news in the world. The God of this age is Satan, and Satan has blinded the mind of the unbelieving so that they can't see Christ for who he really is. They don't see the glory of Christ in the gospel. That's his work. That's what kind of person Satan is, and that's what he does. So we have to ask ourselves, what kind of person is this? This person is a spiritually blind person. And what does Paul see their greatest need? Their greatest need is for the gospel itself. Their greatest need is for the thing that they can't see. They need the true gospel. So in verse 5, Paul says, We do not preach ourselves, but we preach Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as slaves for the sake of Jesus. So this is what God loves to use to reach the lost. He loves to use the preaching of Jesus Christ as Lord and we know what this means, Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's walk through each of those three words. Jesus means God saves, Jehovah saves. That's Jesus' name, Jehovah saves. Christ is a reference to the Messiah, the coming king who will rule over this earth. And Lord is a supreme ruler. So we see who God saves in verse 6. But first we need to recognize that Paul's confidence is in God's ability to save we don't preach ourselves, we preach Jesus Christ as Lord. Look down to verse 6. God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, he is the one who has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. God shines into the dark heart of the unbeliever. And he does that to make them able to comprehend Jesus for who he is. That is the gospel message. And there are many trials that are listed in verses 7 through 11. And these are the trials that come from following Christ and bearing witness and testimony of him to the lost world around you. Living for Christ can be exceedingly difficult. And it was particularly in that day when the church was just getting started. But the message of the true gospel is not just that God saves a person, but that he gives them the grace to persevere through the trials that will come because he saved them. He summarizes it in verse 17 with encouraging words. The trials are a light and a momentary affliction. And those things are working out for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. So affliction is working out a weight. And working out for us means speaking or producing or bringing forth something. Those who truly have Christ as their master, they prove it by persevering through the trials that come with their belief in Christ. Then they persevere to the very end of their life. And that re perseverance results in eternity of sharing in God's glory. But we also see in verse 18 that the true gospel has the effect of changing the focus of the person who believes it. Paul writes, We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And the true gospel we come to read here produces and involves a message that involves a change of citizenship 
a citizenship that's no longer in this world, but it's in heaven. It's mentioned this morning in reference to Philippians chapter 3. And Paul makes that point, and he starts to pursue that beginning in chapter 5. We see in verses 1 and 2, we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, that's our body, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. The person who comes to saving faith in Christ realizes that there is some countable finite number of years left in their life here on this earth. And that years, those years will be filled with a battle against sin and an increasing sanctification and an increasing ability to reflect the character of Christ in our lives. But what is beyond what the believer longs for is our eternal state, the place where we will be for eternity, infinitely more time than we will spend here. And so Paul brings to a a point of change in focus here, and we can see it in verses 9 and 15. In verse 9, Paul talks about the ambition of the believer. He says, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. So whether in this life or in the next life, we're seeking to please God. In verse 15, he died for all, that's Christ, so that they who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And they can do that because sin is no longer their master. They have the ability to pursue pleasing their master rather than pleasing sin. Points to that in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away and new things have come. The person who is new in Christ is new at many levels. What is gone is slavery to sin. What has come is pursuit of Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so how can Paul be so confident of all of these things? Well, the crux of that is pointed out in verse 21. The one who has to spell it out, Paul spells it out for the Corinthians so that they can understand it so clearly what it is that God does to actually save people. He writes, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The he there is God. The him there is Christ. God made Christ, who knew no sin, sin. It's important for us to see this. We all know this, but God is the subject of this verse. That means that God is performing the action. God performed the action of making Christ sinful so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There is an exchange going on there where God takes the sin of all of those who would put their trust in Christ and transfers it onto Christ, and he takes the righteousness of Christ and he puts it on those same people. And God justifies those people on the basis of their belief in Christ as their substitutionary atonement. So that's the gospel. And Paul defends his apostolic ministry by saying, I preached the true gospel. But he also says, one way you can know that I preached, that I have a a genuine true gospel ministry is because my message was a message of ongoing sanctification. It wasn't a message of believe this and be done. It was a message of believe this and live a transformed life. And he points to a couple areas in which the church really does need to grow. And again, the grace that saves the person is the same grace that sanctifies them throughout the rest of their life. One of the areas that that Paul pointed to them in their need to grow was they needed to grow in their ability to reconcile themselves with Paul. We see that in verses 11 through 13 of chapter 6. Paul writes, Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is opened wide. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained by your own affections. Now in a like exchange, open wide to us also. So Paul is saying, I've done everything on my end to live at peace with you, but what is holding back, what is holding you back from reconciling with me is you. It's your own affections. You are restrained in your own affection. So he says in verse 2, Make room for us in your hearts. We wronged nobody. We corrupted nobody. We took advantage of nobody. Paul is saying, you have a, a need to grow. You need to grow in your ability to reconcile with people. He points to something else as well in that same area. He starts, and he starts by the need to uh, exhort the church to separate from the worldliness that's so present in Corinth. Corinth. 
In verse 14, he says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You have been set apart by Christ. You've been set apart for Christ. So don't make oneness with someone who is not in Christ themselves. We see it as well in verse 1 of chapter 7. Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. So one of the encouraging things for us to see is that Paul is exhorting them to reconcile with one another. There's a point of application for us. Is there in your life a a brother or a sister where you coexist with some sort of uneasy peace? It's not a genuine peace. Or you've sort of sorted things out, but when you get together, you still feel uneasy about that person. They feel uneasy towards you. One way you can show that you're growing in your sanctification is delighting in the process of living at peace with one another. And the next defense of Paul's apostolic ministry is his encouragement of a worthy celebration. And this may seem like a small issue, but it's, it's a really significant issue because people will be involved in sin with one another on many occasions within the church, and the church will be involved in restoring that person into right relationships with those. And that restoration and that celebration is exceedingly important. So uh, it's an essential step in the protecting the purity of the church. So after his sorrowful visit to the church, Paul dispatched Titus to that church. And he was again probably carrying that sorrowful letter. And again, the main purpose of that letter was to appeal to them to recognize that they had embraced a false gospel and they were starting to get behind the false teachers. Paul left Ephesus on his third missionary journey and he moved into Macedonia and he was very eager to see what the fruit of his letter was. And so he made a search for Titus. And in verse 6 of chapter 7, we see that they actually did meet up. God who comforts the humbled comforted us by the coming of Titus. And Titus comes with the news that the church had actually repented and the lead false teacher had heeded his letter. Paul writes in verse 7, he reported to us, this is Titus reporting to Paul and his companions, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. The Corinthians were broken over their sin for rejecting Paul. Not initially, but they were after he wrote the, the sorrowful letter. And there are some critical elements of that sorrow, and it's seen in verses 8 through 11. The first is that they had a godly sorrow. The foundation of any repentance is a godly sorrow over your sin. It is not the repentance of the sin. It starts with a godly sorrow of your offense against a holy God. And then it's characterized by an earnestness. This is the disposition that you maintain while you're removing that sin from your life. And it bears itself out in the fact that you vindicate yourself. You're indignant over your sin. You have a fear of God of where your sin will take you. You long for fellowship with the church. You long for a restored relationship with them. You have zeal in your working out of your sin. And you do everything within yourself to make it right with everybody else that you can who is affected by your sin. But Paul is not flexing his authority here. Instead, what he's doing, he's he's showing the church in Corinth that his shepherding care over them is in perfect alignment with the design that Jesus himself spelled out for us in Matthew 18. There was a man who was caught in his sin and he was prompted by Paul's painful letter to the church to repent from his sin and he actually did repent from his sin. And this is an occasion for great joy, great celebration. It's something that every church should long for. Paul writes in verse 13, for this reason we have been comforted and besides our comfort we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. So Paul is again defending his apostolic ministry and what he's doing is he's pointing to his faithfulness to the design that Jesus spelled out for the church to protect the church and to secure the purity of the church. So those are a number of the ways in which Paul is defending his apostolic ministry, his ministry as an apostle. And again, the the apostle is the one who is receiving from God the gospel message. This is written at a time when we don't have our complete New Testament. This was on the front end of the New Testament being recorded. And so as an apostle, Paul was responsible for receiving that divine revelation from God, writing that divine revelation down in the form of letters to churches, 
and then preaching that same message. And Paul puts on display all of the ways in which his ministry demonstrated that it was a valid ministry, that his ministry was from God. Chapters 8 and 9 talk about a collection that's being made for the church. We're just going to spend a few minutes there, and then we're going to move on to how Paul defends his authority as an apostle. But life was hard for the Jews that were living in Jerusalem. It was exceedingly hard because on one hand, the Romans hated them because they were Jews. And on the other hand, the Jews hated them because they were Christians. And it was challenging for them to eke out any kind of meager existence. It was hard for them to find work. It was hard for them to keep work. So Paul arranged for a collection to be taken among the churches in Asia Minor and Macedonia and in Achaia. And then he was going to take that collection and provide it to the church and the poor church in Jerusalem to assist them in their poverty. And the the poor churches in Macedonia were exemplary for this. Corinth and Athens were big cities. They were wealthy. They had lots of commerce, lots of sin. They had lots of money floating around. The poor churches up in the north in Macedonia, north of Philippi, uh, they were exemplary. They gave beyond their means. They gave in lots of ways. They gave joyfully. They gave of their own accord and all of that. And they were exemplary. And and Paul is writing in chapter 8 and chapter 9 to the wealthy Christians in Corinth, and he is saying, follow the example of your brothers in the north. You need to follow their example and participate in God's design for the body to care for the body. And so you see two chapters devoted to that, and in that there are lots of principles that that relate to the way in which a person should think about the way in which they provide aid and service and assistance to other members of the body. So we're going to look at the way that Paul defends his apostolic authority in verses 10 and following. But before we go through this, we need to stop and, and take a step back and frame this up properly. Paul is being attacked, his credentials and his credibility is being attacked by these false teachers. And we're, what we're looking at here is a defense that's being made by a man who is probably and very likely the greatest theologian and the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. It's almost absurd that he's defending himself this way, and that he has to do this. But he defends his authority because he knows how important it is that the church in Corinth understand that the message that he spoke to them was a message of authority from God. And so he spends three or four chapters explaining how it is that he truly was um, one with authority as an apostle. And the first thing he points to is that he has humility but it's a conditioned humility. It's not a humility in all circumstances at every occasion. It's a humility that characterizes himself as a person, but he has occasions in which something else takes place. But when you read Philippians chapter three, you get to see a long list of Paul's credentials. And and we know this, Paul says that I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was from the tribe of Benjamin and I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee, I was zealous, And I was blameless in my pursuit of the law. If there was anybody who had cause and right to throw their weight around, it was Paul. He just says, look at my pedigree. I am the one you should be listening to. And he doesn't do that. Let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 10 to see what Paul puts on display. He puts on display his character. I, Paul, myself plead with you by gentleness and forgiveness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but courageous towards you when absent. I beg that when I am present, I need not act so courageously with the confidence that I consider to daringly use against some who consider as if we walked according to the flesh. So in chapter or in verse one, Paul is pleading with them. Here's the greatest theologian in the world. Here's the greatest missionary the world has ever known pleading with them. In verse two, he's begging with them. And he's dealing with an unstable, immature, rebellious, fickle church. But he pleads with them and he begs with them. That is true humility. But he's not a wallflower. And we can see that when we look again at verse 2. I beg that I need not act so courageously with the confidence that I consider to daringly use. Again, Paul's baseline characteristic is he is a humble man. He will always be a humble man but he is ready to act courageously when the situation warrants it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the man who has a humble confidence in God's word, but a readiness to speak with courageous confidence is the kind of man who in the first century of the church 
had the authority to reveal, receive divine revelation from God as to the true content of the gospel and then to preach that true gospel to the church. It's the man who has Paul's characteristics here. On one hand, he's humble, but on the other hand, he knows the message and he's so confident in the message that he is ready to speak it courageously. So that points to his conditioned humility. He's humble, but when he needs to speak courageously about the truth of the gospel that he himself knows because God imparted it to him, he is ready to do that. And secondly, he has a conferred authority. This is really important for us to understand because all of these false teachers, they came with some sort of other supposed authority, but Paul says that my authority was actually given to me. And we'll see that when we start looking at verses three and following. He says that though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Paul is saying, I'm a human being just like everybody else. So I have a human body, but I don't use my gifting. I don't use my attributes to address these spiritual issues. I don't use what I am given. He says in verse four, he alludes to the authority that he leans on. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. I'm not gonna engage in warfare with you with my own skills and my own abilities, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. So Paul puts his trust in divinely powerful means. We drop down to verse seven. We see that This is not first and foremost something that is outwardly evident in Paul. He says, you are looking at things outwardly. And that is what they see in these false teachers. What he's saying there is, if you're looking for outward indicators that a man has the authority of an apostle, then you're not going to find it. The authority doesn't have its origin in man. The authority comes from God. And that's the fundamental distinction between what Paul demonstrated and what the Corinthians understand. We see this in verse eight, for even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for tearing you down, I will not be put to shame. The authority is from the Lord. Paul is saying, God gave me that authority so that I could build you up. I don't carry this, uh, carry this authority with any kind of pride because God gave it to me for the purpose of building you up. I didn't use it to tear you down. Verse 11, consider this that we are what we are in word by letters when absent, such persons we also are in deed when present. So what Paul is saying is you need to understand who I am. The kind of man that, that you see me to be in my letters, I'm that same man in person. Not because I'm, I'm big and impressive in person, but because both of those situations, whether it's his writing or his actual personal interaction with them in person are evidences of the authority that God conferred onto him. So Paul's defense of his apostolic authority is that God gave it to him and he was faithful to use that authority in the authoring and the teaching of what we have and what we call today our New Testament. And this is a sign of true humility. And then Paul points to his credentials and we see this and he has an irrefutable credential and we start in verse 12 and Paul is mindful of what takes place when a man spits out his credentials. He knows this. And he knows that it's not good. He says in verse one of chapter 12, it is necessary, if it is necessary, sorry, it is necessary to boast, though it is not profitable. He's in a situation where these people need to hear what it is that that Paul has that is the true authority as an apostle. He feels the need to help them understand something that is an affirmation of his apostleship, and that is his visions. There are as many as six occasions in Acts that show the visions that Paul had. And he speaks of himself in the third person. And the reason why he does that is to keep the focus of the attention away from himself and on the one who provided the visions. In verse two, he says, I know a man who in Christ 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I don't know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. Paul is speaking of his own experience that he had. And the experience was so beyond the realm of this world that it simply blew Paul away. There are two separate descriptions here. Paul says, I was caught up in the third heaven. And he says, I was caught up into paradise. These are referring to the same thing. It's referring to the abode of God, the place where God dwells. 
Isaiah 66, God says, heaven is my throne room and the earth is my footstool. Paul is saying, I was caught up into an experience in God's abode, in the throne room of heaven. But here is what relates to Paul's apostolic authority in verse four, at the end of the verse. Paul heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. This was divine revelation to Paul, a kind of revelation that none of us has ever heard before. And so what Paul was doing was he was taking in divine revelation of epic magnitude, something beyond what we've ever seen. It was so profound that he wasn't permitted to speak it to others. We don't know the content of the visions, but the nature of the revelation and that it was given to Paul, it stands as an affirmation of Paul's credentials for his apostolic authority. So Paul gives at least three reasons that his apostleship was one with true authority from God. And so Paul went about the process of defending his ministry. He went about the process of defending his authority. And he didn't do that to validate himself or vindicate himself. He did that so that the people in Corinth would understand that the message that he gave them was the true message, the one that they should believe and the one they should understand. Paul makes a a few comments in closing after chapter 12, towards the end of chapter 12. And in verse 21, he starts to express once again his real genuine concern for ongoing sexual sin there. He says, I'm afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity, immorality, sensuality, which they have practiced. Paul is mindful that there is sin going on and it grieves him. He will mourn over it. In chapter 13, he exhorts them to examine themselves. In verse 5, he says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. Take stock of your own walk with the Lord. Look at yourself and evaluate. Do you really have within yourself what scripture says is true of the person who possesses saving faith? So he wants them to get rid of sexual sin. He wants them to leave that far behind, repent from that. He wants them to examine themselves to see if they're in the faith. And he also makes an appeal to unity. And we see that in verse 11. He says, finally, brothers, rejoice, be restored, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. He wants them to rejoice. The realities of new life in Christ should lead any believer to joy. And particularly these people, because the offending man had repented. He said, be restored. The body is a single entity consisting of many parts. We all know that. And so we need to mend relationships that are harmed by sin. So he's exhorting them, be restored. He's exhorting them to be comforted. He says, Comfort one another. When you sin against one another, there's genuine forgiveness. Comfort one another over that sin and let them know that you want them to begin participating in in gospel life again. Have them participate in gospel life as one who's been comforted and been restored. And he says, be like-minded. The only way you can be like-minded is not to believe the message of the false teachers. The only way you can be like-minded is to listen to the true message and believe that message. And that is the message that allows you to live in peace. You can live at peace with one another when you believe the true gospel. When you do all of that, you have God's blessing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are a good God. You are a merciful and a kind God that you would give to us the story of a man who labored hard with this church in Corinth. Lord, it is sobering to see the the depths of sin and the hardships that a church will cause the one who loves them so much. Lord, I thank you for his ministry to that church. I thank the Lord, so thankful that you gave him that ministry, and you gave him apostleship, you gave him the message of the gospel. Lord, it's, it's apparent that that church is not present in Corinth anymore. Lord, I pray for us that we would be a church that holds fast to the true gospel, that does not depart from what we know to be true. Lord, would you help us? Would you grant us the grace to embrace that message and believe it and hold fast to it? Whether our life ahead has increasing ease or increasing hardship, Lord, may we the same hold fast to the one true gospel.
Lord God, I pray for us that we'd be a church that, that use that true gospel in our interactions with one another, that you would allow us to speak with truth to one another and encourage one another. I pray that we would be exceedingly good, Lord, at restoring with one another and comforting one another and assuring one another of their place in the body and enjoying restored fellowship. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do it, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.